What's up guys and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Eric Sun and I'm an incoming first year medical student at McMaster University. Today I'll be answering one of the questions that I get the most frequently, which is, Eric, how do I improve my CAR score? So today I'll be going through a full practice passage and I'll be showing you how I'm reading it as well as how I answer the questions afterwards. Now this method helped me score a 131 when I wrote the test last year. Before we start, I just want to remind you that getting better at cars is a slow and gradual learn skill. You didn't learn how to read in one day, and you're definitely not going to learn how to ace cars in one day. You have to work at it every single day until you see that gradual and slow improvement. If you want to check out more information about how you can improve in cars, make sure to check out this link up here. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel because that really helps me out with the YouTube algorithm so that I can get this advice out to more and more people. With all that being said, let's get into it. Okay, so we're going to use Jack Weston for our practice. And what I really like about Jack Weston is that the interface is the exact same as the actual MCAT. So at the top right, we can see there's a timer to see how long we've been working on the passage. There's also a question count to see which one we're on. And you can use the flag for review to flag any questions you're having trouble with and come back to them later. At the top left, there's also the strike through and highlight function. And you can use that and select the text to highlight or strike through. And these are really great for organizing your thoughts and making sure you get all of the important points of the passage down. Now that we know how to use the interface, let's begin. So the first sentence, immediately the first thing I see is that it's an I believe, which tells us that the rest of the sentence is going to be about the opinion of the author. And then we later see that it's about the difference between science and art in the 19th century. The author then goes on to bring in uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, and assumably that's to either support their opinion or bring in a counter argument to their opinion. So after that, in the third sentence, we can see that Thomas Henry Huxley is talking about the difference between the intellectual content of art and the intellectual content of science. So that means he's actually here to support the opinions of the author. He goes, he goes on to talk about how in art, truth is relative. And he gives a few examples about how no man under, understands Shakespeare until he's old, though the youngest may admire him. Those are just essentially examples of how truth is relative to art. And then he concludes the paragraph by stating that in science, intellectual content is truth to fact. Contrast that to art, where truth is relative, when science, truth is fact. In the second paragraph, we kind of go into a bit of a change in topic. The first sentence is talking about the pleasures that we get from art or science which are essentially the same thing, according to Huxley, they have a common source. So thus far, we know that art and science are different, but the pleasures we get from them are the same. The second sentence goes on to say, these pleasures arise from the satisfaction one receives in tracing the central theme of whatever he is interested in at the moment, and all its endless variations as it appears and reappears to demonstrate the truth of unity in variety. Then after that, it goes on to give a few examples, just a few, <laughs> the problem mathematics, experiment morphology, a chess game, primitive drawing, sophisticated painting, simple ballad, complex poem, a homely refrain, or a fugue by Bach. The process of comprehending the symbols used to express the idea is both intellectual and aesthetic. So in this list, we can see there are several things that can be classified as science or art. Mathematics would be an example of science, whereas a homely refrain might be an example of art. And the passage goes on to emphasize that both of these things can in fact be intellectual and aesthetic. The passage then goes on to talk about how the process is intellectual because it is the intellect which comprehends the laws governing any particular science or art. And it is aesthetic because it is the feelings which determine the amount of emotional pleasure one can derive from them. But the ends of the two are different. So again, here is another difference between science and art. The two subjects of all knowledge are divisible into two groups, said Huxley. Matters of science and matters of art. For all things which with the reasoning faculty alone is occupied come under the province of science. All things feelable, all things which stir the emotion come under the term art. So here we can see another difference between science and art. Huxley believes that science comes under reasoning and thought, whereas art is more our emotions. Okay, now in the last paragraph, 
we can see that another opinion, the author says, I believe science is slowly destroying art. If it has destroyed art only, that would not be so bad. But science has also destroyed the highest aspirations of the human soul. The author really hates science. Uh, the paragraph of the paragraph is essentially the same kind of thing, saying how science is really eating away at art, making reducing love to a biologic law. Life loses the qualities which have made it beautiful. Despair takes the place of hope. Resignation takes the place of resolution. Yeah, the author is just not having it with science right now. Uh, wise and intelligent men become cynics, and common men become hedonists. Now, even if you don't know what hedonist means, you can assume from the rest of the passage, or the rest of the paragraph in this case, that hedonist is probably a bad thing. Just like in the earlier bit of that sentence, you can see wise and intelligent men become cynics, or very cynical, which is typically a bad thing. Common men are becoming hedonists, which we can now assume is a bad thing. And like that, we are now done at 4 minutes and 32 seconds going through a first read-through of the passage. So now let's try to look at the questions and see what we can do. Okay, so if we just restart the timer, we can see the question is asking if scientific progress is increasing the amount of great art that is being produced based on the third paragraph, is the author's general opinion about the negative impacts of science likely to change? Well, first thoughts are no. The author really hates science. Uh, it destroys the soul is the main concern. Uh, nothing about not trusting a scientist, uh, but D, D seems like it's right because, um, yeah, its effect on the soul is the primary concern, not its effect on art. Uh, a and B seem wrong because they both start with yes. I think the author's opinion wouldn't change. Um, and then, yeah, both these options are saying that the science, you know, science isn't really that bad. All right, if we go to question two, according to Huxley, the pleasure derived from science compares the pleasure derived from art in the following way. According to Huxley, true pleasure is derived only from art and not from science. The passage never talks about true pleasure, just you know, general kinds of pleasure. There are distinct types of pleasure that derive from either science or art. Uh, same, same thing. It's you know, distinct types of pleasure, true pleasure. Science offers intellectual pleasure, while art offers aesthetic pleasure. Well, that's wrong, because we know that art and science offer both. So the last one must be right. The type of pleasure offered by science and art is similar, if not the same. Question three. Which type of following is an idea attributed to Huxley? Oops, just uh, crossed it out. There you go, highlight it that arguably contradicts another idea also attributed to Huxley. Uh, a seems right. Uh, I'm looking at that because B and D seem like they kind of are saying the same thing, uh, which often is a giveaway that neither of them is correct. And C is also something actually that the author says. Which of the following cannot be inferred from the passage? Uh, the author believes that Science is a large source of immorality in society because it is incompatible with religion, or science and art have nothing in common. Those seem a little extreme, so let's skip them for now. Uh, C, we know that there are great sources of pleasure for members of society. Uh, art is less destructive than science. Mm. You can infer that because if saying science destroys art, then art will be less destructive than science. Mm. A, if it's incompatible with religion. That seems wrong because uh, if science does destroy art, that means it is incompatible and can be inferred. So therefore, art and science have nothing in common, which was pretty extreme anyways. Question five, which one is typical of science? So science is more reasoning and thought, and art is more feelings. Uh, companionship and care definitely sounds like feelings, so that's probably art. Uh, captivating and beautiful images, again, that kind of sounds like art. Uh, synaptic pathways involved with happiness. Happiness sounds like art, but we're talking about the pathways. Uh, that might not be art. Let's check this for now. That sounds probably like our best option so far. Uh, a lethal weapon that drastically increases casualties and conflict. Uh, that also doesn't sound right because science is just thinking and reasoning. It doesn't have to be so negative, but let's flag that for now. Question six, tree of knowledge in paragraph three to support which point? So let's find tree of knowledge at the end. G, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, can be as disastrous today as it was ages ago in the Garden of Eden. A says the scientific pursuit of knowledge has detrimental effects. That sounds right. Uh, B doesn't seem right. I don't think he's trying to make a point about science as an endeavor. Uh, you can also believe in scientific truth and religious truth. I don't think the author is saying that. And I don't think the author is trying to divide all knowledge into science and art. And just like that, 8 minutes and 17 seconds. 
finished all of them. Let's go through the solutions now. So question one, we did get correct. This is the one we believe that the author is talking about the effect of science on the soul instead of on art. Question two, we can see that, yeah, uh, according to Huxley, the type of pleasure offered by art and science are basically the exact same. See so for question three. Yep, we got this one right. We didn't even have to really look at the answer. Uh, I did this as an example to show you how you can process of elimination down to the correct answer. You don't even need to read the actual answer. Question four. Uh, yep, we got this one right. Uh, option B is pretty extreme, and we saw that the other ones were all uh, had examples from the text. Question five. Uh, yep, again, D was a little bit too emotional, whereas we're just talking about uh, reasoning and thought. Option six, uh, yep, this one, pretty self-explanatory. If it's as disastrous today, it's pretty bad, and detrimental effects is essentially saying the exact same thing as in the passage. So that was one Cars practice passage from start to finish, and I really hope that one of those tips was helpful for you. Leave a comment down below for ideas for future videos or if you'd like to see more of this type of practice. Thanks for watching, and make sure to subscribe to the channel. That was your daily dose of Medi Sun, and I'll see you in the next video.